Welcome to the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 702. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is November 19th, 2021. All right, welcome to the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted. It's Friday, George, and I, I just think about RV bills because, you know, if you own an RV, you have RV maintenance issues. And I posted a picture this week of the muffler that fell off. That's not cheap. We needed a new LP tank because of the rust this collected when it was in Connecticut. That wasn't cheap. Uh, you know, you basically, and the joke is you're driving an earthquake through a tornado. That's what owning an RV is like. <laughs> and I managed to learn how to drive without knocking anything off the counter, shelves, or drawers. However, it's still, the road is not not kind to the RV. And so you, you either buy a brand new one or you, you, you pay to keep the old one alive. And currently we're, we're keeping the old one alive. George, how is your week going? Well, I was doing auto repair. I got some time off and I got to replace brake pads and brake fluids, and I wanted to do some welding, but my wife wouldn't let me use the welder, welding torch, settling torch on her car. <laughs> you need an arc welder. She's really mean that way. <laughs> yes. But I did say, oh, well, Susan, I this bolt is just frozen solid, so can I use the torch to loosen it up? Oh, I guess so. Uh, <laughs> So well, yeah. I did get to play with fire a little bit. Once you get to the I welding... only burned my hand once. Uh... <laughs> That's gonna say once you get to the welding tools, you're only minutes away from going to urgent care. Uh, that that's what I found it, whenever I try to do, and I don't do my own maintenance. George, you, it, it's wonderful. You could be an RV mechanic. Uh, you love working on cars. For me, just thinking about working on the car raises my blood pressure. And my yeah. pants keep falling down. I'd be perfect, you know, RV <laughs> mechanic with my underwear sticking out and everything. It's, oh, uh, the butt but crack you know, Episcopalian. I, uh -huh. I just, I just love working with my hands mm -hmm. uh, on mechanical things. I don't know what it is, but there's a sense of, oh, I don't want to get all airy fairy, but there's a sense of dignity in manual labor that mm -hmm. our our nation is so quick to dismiss that unless you go to college, you're a nobody. Believe me, I've been to college. It seems like a half of my life. And at college, it doesn't make you a somebody. No. Your character is what counts, not the pieces of paper on the walls. Uh, the, the, I think the wealthiest guy I know in Florida is the RV mechanic here at Florida Grand. I mean, you guys, he drives around. He's probably one of the happiest, too. I mean, <laughs> he he's, he's got his captive market. <laughs> Every time he pulls up to my camper, there's money to be made, but it, it's fun to watch because he'll be here half an hour, and about the time he's here, 35, 40 minutes, there's about 10 golf carts from all my other neighbors coming over to ask him a question. And no, no, no. He's a, I, I, That's my dime. He's not answering questions until he's done here. So it, it, it's a unique lifestyle and you're right manual labor hard labor blue collar labor labor is no longer respected uh like it should be it, it's the industrial base built america and has saved america and now we're getting to the point where everything's going to be robotic everybody's going to have to receive a living wage because they can't work in the uh the blue collar fields because we've turned it over to ai and robots oh i'm complaining george let, let's start with a good news story. What, what, what Do we pick one? Yeah, uh, you, you mentioned the Queen's speech to General Synod. Yeah, well, I mentioned that in our previous recording. <laughs> it's okay, it's all right, all right, all right. Did uh, you mention I, that? Yeah, well, this is the second time we're taping today. And so... I mean, we, you mentioned it on Tuesday, or you mentioned no, no. it in our previous I, recording this morning? This morning, I mentioned it. So when you say it, the audience... Up. Yeah, we did. The audience has no idea that I, I previously mentioned oh. it. They didn't get to see it. So and, and, let's and neither do I. <laughs> you, barely, you need coffee like I need coffee. George, tell me about the Queen's speech, please. <laughs> well, it's traditional that the Sovereign uh, gives the speech to the opening session to Synod. Synod meets over several years in England, twice a year, compared to the American system of a new synod or new convention every every two years or so. Mm. And Queen Elizabeth uh, was unable to go in person, but she wrote a speech delivered by her son Edward. And it was a remarkably up, it spoke to the realities of her aging, 
but also her deep faith in Jesus Christ. And I think she's the most unabashedly Christian leader on the world stage. Uh, and I include Pope Francis in this. <laughs> well, uh, but it, there's truth in that. She is from the, the World War II generation, the greatest generation uh, of people you t so far to live on the earth. They, they self-sacrifice, you know, uh, unequivocal. They, they gave their lives, you know, in a time of war, in a time of sacrifice that came out of the Depression. They know more about living than we ever will. And when I see the Queen get up there and give a speech, reminding the bishops of what their job was, I'm like, yes. We had a, in a show comments for the last episode, uh, one of our viewers from England pointed out that uh, America seems a much more religious culture than Britain because we talk about sort of common understandings and attitudes that are now foreign uh, from the English mindset. And I think Queen Elizabeth gets religion, unlike, say, Boris Johnson or mm -hmm. the leader of the opposition parties or most television talking heads. The Queen uh, gets religion, gets faith, understands its place in the lives of so many people in the way that the elites in Britain and in the United States these days don't. So when I say that she's probably most religiously attuned Christian leader on the world stage, I'm not using, in, involved in hyperbole. Mm. Um, I think Queen Elizabeth may not be valued in some quarters today, but wait until she's gone and you see what you've got now. Yeah, then well, you'll I... basically regret what you, not appreciating what you had. <laughs> this colonialist, uh, I'm worried about her health. You know, she's uh, well into her 90s, and she's uh, had a recent fall, and she's, I think she missed the first uh, Remembrance Day ever, so. Yes, she was ill, and I think this, you're right. Since mm -hmm. since she took, uh, since she was car carnated, this is the first Remembrance Sunday, which is they move uh, Veterans Day, Armistice Day celebrations to church on the Sunday around November 11th, and this is the first one she's missed, I understand. Mm -hmm. Due to ill health. Let's move on to the sorry. Uh, Justin Welby said he was sorry-ish. Well, he said sorry. Uh, that he overreacted and kind of said there was a cloud over the, the remembrance of uh, George Bell. And I thought, oh, I don't want to judge another person sorry. He said sorry. He's at, he didn't ask for forgiveness, but he said he was sorry. That's good enough for me, Kevin, but uh, I want to talk about this because yes, we need to really investigate uh, accusations of uh, the sexual nature uh, of our leaders. The bishops need to be held to a different standard above reproach, but the way this was handled it, it is wrong on so many levels, and they had this wonderful report I forget the guy who wrote the report that said you, you, you mishandled this and this guy is innocent i wish justin welby had said the bishop is innocent that would have meant a lot more than just saying i'm sorry i overreacted but george um two stories two weeks in a row that's not bad it it has been connie francis month for uh, justin <laughs> welby uh, for those not familiar, Connie Francis had a very popular hit in the early 1960s called I'm Sorry. Oh, so, so sorry. sorry. Yeah. Please accept my apology. And it has to be done in a very saccharine sort of tone. Uh, Justin Welby apologized to Ghana for his uh, statements about their family values bill. Mm -hmm. He now apologized to the family and supporters of uh, Bishop, George, Bishop Bell of Chichester saying that he no longer believed that a cloud lay over the reputation of George Bell, who was probably the greatest bishop, if not, certainly within that handful of four or five greatest bishops in terms of accomplishments, personal holiness, uh, historical worth in the Church of England in the 20th century. Evidenced by the fruits of his ministry, absolutely. And. Well, of course, this we've talked about this for years now of the unjust and fact, you know, just dreadful way that Bell has been treated as a scapegoat for other Church of England failings, um, and how just Welby abused uh, the whole system 
and, and uh, Martin uh, Warner, the Bishop of Chichester, who has yet to apologize, I understand, mm -hmm. uh, have just done Bell and his memory a disservice. See, in the Anglican world, uh, if if you've if you've been accused of misconduct, you have a right to defend yourself, and a bishop can, while you're in the process, inhibit you, meaning you can no longer uh, partake in public ministry. But that's the only sort of ex parte punishment until there's been an adjudication. And even when you're inhibited, it has to be very closely and care carefully crafted so that you just don't sort of give a blanket. You may do nothing but sit in your room for five years till we figure this out. If you're, if you're accused of stealing, well, you're not allowed to handle money. If you're accused of fooling around with women, you may no longer do pastoral counseling, that sort of thing. Uh, but what Welby did was the equivalent of inhibiting George Bell without any trial, without mm -hmm. any opportunity of response, diminishing and demeaning his reputation. If Bell were alive, Bell could sue for libel, for okay, destroying well, his reputation. Stop right there. I know a current Archbishop former of, of Canterbury who is still alive, who has been uh, diminished by the words of the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, who should sue as well or expect an apology uh, as, as Bell got. And his name is Lord Carey. Yeah, this is the second George. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe Justin doesn't like Georges. George <laughs> Bell, George Carey. George Conger. George Conger. Uh, you know, maybe there's something in the name there, but you're absolutely right, Kevin. Mm -hmm. I think George Carey. Uh, well, George Carey doesn't need the money, mm -hmm. but he certainly needs the professional vindication of the unjust attacks on his character and reputation made by Justin Welby. Yeah. Um, it's, it's so difficult. <sighs> Yes, you're right. We need to stamp out every uh, evil that is perpetrated by, within the church by members of the clergy, by lay people within who have church positions of authority. But at this, by the same token, we cannot have the opposite overreach and overreaction of somebody's accusing George Bell of a crime that occurred three years after Bell died. Well, we have to you know, shut him down, take his name off buildings, uh, hide him from our memory, remove him from the church calendar um, no, because it, somebody has made a complaint. The overreaction is to put somebody down the memory hole, where the immediate reaction to something like this, if there's a, a sexual allegation, is stop everything, do an investigation to see if the allegations hold any merit. If they do, proceed from there. Um, what we've had in the past is there's been an accusation and it gets the person gets transferred to another diocese or another country uh, and that was completely wrong and what you're doing to George what you did to George Bell and uh, Lord Carey um, were overreactions to what you were doing wrong before doesn't and make a it right it's not it's not just Justin Welby who's mm -hmm. done this our whole society English and American Western society I'll start with another George. Do you remember George Zimmerman, the Florida man who uh, was accused of being a vigilante and shooting uh, a 17-year-old career criminal? Um, and we had all of this pre-judgment, pre-trial publicity, people marching, this was a racist thing, even though Zimmerman is a Hispanic person of color with Afro-Caribbean roots from Peru. Yeah. He's a white supremacist. Uh, and now it's all the way up to the Kyle Rittenhouse, where Kyle Rittenhouse is accused of shooting, uh, accused of murdering two other men and wounding a third, and it's all white supremacy. And he shot three white guys. And he's and if you read M MSNBC and the popular press, this man is a guilty racist monster. Yeah. yeah. And it's almost like, oh well, never mind. Sorry. Uh, well, I mean, no, no, hold I on. Work it in Louisville, Kentucky. The uh, exonerating well. tape was finally released last night. The high definition uh, FBI drone footage. And okay, the guy is innocent. But you will see all day long today CNN, NBC, uh, MSNBC uh, still proclaiming you can't kill somebody in self defense. One yeah. of the things, here's a little thing. Um, 
being a parish priest, you see this a lot, children of divorced parents. Mm. People say, this Kyle Rittenhouse, he went to Kenosha just looking for trouble because he's from Illinois. Kyle Rittenhouse's parents are divorced and his father lives in Kenosha, Wisconsin. And there's joint custody yeah. and he moves back and forth. For children of divorced families where the parents live in different places, they in essence have two hometowns. Um, it, you know, that's just a little minor and silly thing. Well, but it's it, it, it's it's so not it's minor. Twisted. The problem is, you and I are journalists, and when we see what's happening in the national journalistic empire, you know, mass media, it's just criminal. I am so disappointed with how this trial's been reported. The judge is upset. Uh, he banned MSNBC from the courtroom yesterday because they were following jurors home. You, I just I. It, we've just completely lost it. There's no journalism left anymore. Uh, every story is completely biased. You and I have complained countless times that there's no longer two sides of a story. Um, here, you're guilty until you are hung by your neck in the square. And yeah. the, the, the thread that takes us from George Zimmerman to George Carey to George yeah. Bell to Kyle Rittenhouse yeah. and to this bomber who last Sunday blew himself up in Liverpool is a rush to judgment, jumping to conclusions and not letting the system play itself out. Mm -hmm. um, the first news reports are going to be wrong. They're going to be wrong. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when there was that Las Vegas shooter who got a, all these weapons and was in the hotel, a suite in, hotel mm -hmm. and shot up a country music concert? I remember the first things were, this is Al-Qaeda, this is Al-Qaeda, this is Al-Qaeda. And it turned out to be a nut who had... Uh, a, a nut. The FBI report says we do not have any reason to believe that uh, he had motive. And uh, now in England, the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, is saying the Church of England is being taken for a sucker. And that they're basically handing out baptisms to anybody who wants one so that they can claim they can't be sent back to Iran or Syria or Pakistan because they're a Christian convert and they'll be persecuted. Now, this the story that has come out so far that's being pushed by the press, which has not been verified by the police or by anybody to the extent that we know, is that this is a Syrian who converted to Christianity, attended the Alpha Course, uh, lived with a Christian couple, was an unsuccessful asylum seeker, and he started down the plot of radicalization uh, a few months ago, and it was going to culminate in bombing the cathedral in Liverpool. So either this guy was a fake convert to Christianity, or he's the first Anglican suicide bomber. Maybe he's been watching this show yeah, and has been radicalized by Kevin and George mm -hmm. and because the Bishop of Liverpool we've not been complimentary to and Justin Welby used to be the Dean of Liverpool. Maybe he's taken out his anger by blowing himself up. So maybe he's an Anglican suicide bomber or a false convert. But you can't paint everybody who has fled Iran and Syria and Afghanistan and who has accepted Jesus Christ as an opportunist. No. And, and in fact, it's not our job to judge that. If a person uh, is seeking baptism and is seeking a faith in Christ, it's your job to encourage and help that happen. Um, it, it's not your job to judge. It's your job to allow the Holy Spirit to work. And uh, I, I'm sorry if some of the people we baptized became suicide bombers. Yeah. You know, it's like... It's like a doctor who treats somebody for drug addiction or yeah. for alcoholism, and they, then after their treatment, they later fall off the wagon again. Is a doctor being foolish or naive, or was he trying to do his best to help that person, and the person had the free will to either accept or reject mm -hmm. their their cure? A person has, a, has the free will to accept or reject Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. All right, Not well, every person who attends an Alpha course is, is saved. No. Well, let, let's move on from our journalist rant about other journalists. <laughs> it just, it's so frustrating. But let's talk about a fun news story, George. Um, the fun news story for me is, now, you, we've all read the accounts of the First Supper, where Jesus had the disciples gather, and he broke bread well, he, and put it back together. 
and put it back on the table and said, I need to see your voter cards. If you could please get out your voter cards, we can continue with the first Eucharist. They all got out of the cards, even Judas had one. And then he continued breaking bread, passing out the wine, and apparently, in a certain Nigerian diocese, that's the belief. <laughs> you know, the Bishop of Asaba, which is in the Delta State, I believe, uh, yeah, I think which, is, is, yeah. which is on the coast of Nigeria, mm -hmm. where the oil, all the oil is pumped out of the ground, Igbo people there, primarily. Um, he was at a meeting of the Christian Association of Nigeria, along with some other church leaders, Anglican, Catholic, and so on. And he was saying that unless you, uh, that he isn't asking his clergy, and he recommends all clergy in the Delta State, require people to show that their voter registration cards in order to receive Holy Communion or the sacraments, because it is to get rid of corrupt government, to get rid of uh, crooks in a high office, we need to uh, bring to a bring to politics a Christian morality and the way to do this is to have all Christians vote and if you're not getting active in politics you can't come to you can't receive the sacraments just thank God we had a nice crazy story we could report this week I mean here well, Kevin, this is my that, I this mean, is my here, this here. is my body this is my blood show me your card well, Kevin, yeah. here in this part of Florida, as as you will know soon enough, when you go to register, I mean, when you, this is you know, you need a Republican registration card to be able to worship in an Episcopal church in North Central Florida. <laughs> it's so, interesting um, here in in Florida, the fastest way to become a citizen is to register to vote, and all the government uh, state agencies recognize your voter registration as a state ID. You don't get that in Connecticut and other places. You, you, but here, uh, to, the quickest way to get your driver's license and uh, all the other government documents you need to be a citizen is go to the Republican headquarters and register to vote, and you're golden. We, yeah. Well, we had, a, 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 I think, a charming little news incident, incident here. Uh, Governor DeSantis, who is a pretty high flyer, he's one of the few governors that people from outside of his state have heard of. I have no clue who the governor of Connecticut is. I know who the government of California is, but that's probably one of the few, and I'm pretty well in. Well, Kevin, near us is a place that builds itself as the South's largest Ford dealer. Brandon. And, mm. and at Brandon Ford in Brandon, Florida, Governor DeSantis signed a bill uh, on uh, vaccination mandates saying none here in Florida. Man is clever. Uh, man is clever to go to Brandon, Florida to sign this bill. Otherwise, you wouldn't have any reason to go to Brandon, Florida, unless you want to buy a Ford F-150 at a cheap, low price. But you can't, because of the chip shortage. You can't just go to your local Ford dealer and pick anything up. You can probably get a Tesla. But yeah, it, it was smart to go there for political purposes. You know, this, this vaccine mandate uh, was o overturned in the appeals court, finally. Um, but I, what I've seen now is COVID has created a new leper. Uh, the new lepers right now are the unvaccinated. They're, they're treated like they have leprosy, that they can't go into restaurants, that they can't go into government buildings or health facilities without wearing a mask. And it, just basically uh, staying at the edge of the forest and, and yelling, don't approach, I'm a leper. You know, you, you were telling me about a country in Europe, I think, that is Austria. taking the next step. Yes, yes. What's going on? Uh, Austria, uh, if I go here to the headline on Drudge Report, uh, is now a national lockdown. The, something we did here in America back in March of last year. Uh, Austria is finally forced to, even after all the vaccinations uh, and all the other stuff, Germany now says uh, that they're going to have to go back into to lockdown uh, and they're going to require all citizens to have mandatory uh, vaccinations. That's crazy. That is, what if you don't? I, do they you kick you out of the country? Do you have to wear a, a, a little... Uh, yellow badge on your on your side here I don't know I think Kevin I think that's a good idea if you had a little maybe a yellow badge something that you wore on your clothing at all times that prominently identifies you as having polluted blood yeah. uh, you know being an untermensch of some sort uh, for not being vaccinated do we go through the streets and break the windows of unvaccinated shop owners maybe in Seattle that, we do yes in Seattle I guess, we do I, or Portland certainly 
we have uh, lost being very arch I and, know, uh, but silly the, here but uh, have has nobody studied history we're, we're 70 years away from this happening before george oh gosh but you know durham cathedral one of mm -hmm. the big cathedrals uh one of the hot spot hot hot spots one of the touristy spots the dean has announced that uh, you must show your vaccination papers to be able to come to christmas services lepers well, this yeah. is actually contrary to the Church of England's official guidance, which mm -hmm. uh, encourages you to be vaccinated, but will not uh, r forbid your entrance. Now, you have to ask the dean, what is he thinking? What message do you want to give to the world that only the elect, only the pure, only the clean are allowed to worship on Christmas Eve at Durham Cathedral? Yeah. Well, the Diocese of Toronto uh, put in a... Uh, has sort of tried to thread the needle because Canada is very uh, hyper about lockdowns. Mm -hmm. um, Diocese Toronto have said, okay, we've not required you to have, be vaccinated to worship, but what we'll now do is have special services that are vaccinated only. So that in addition to our regular services, we'll have another service, Sunday service where if you are vaccinated and you're fearful of your neighbor, uh, you can be assured that everybody in the congregation has had to show their papers. I, I think that's a good first step, but still, I just don't think the church should be in that business myself. I remember, the, I don't remember, I read about the Church of the Middle Ages, where you went to church and you, you, you cried for sanctuary. But that was a place anybody could go and have sanctuary. And now it's the opposite. We will, <laughs> we require what the culture requires. If you, if you know, we, if the government has a mandate, we have that same mandate. But if I go to San Francisco now and I'm an undocumented alien from a different country, I'll get sanctuary. There's sanctuary cities, um, but there's no sanctuary cities for the unvaccinated. It's crazy. Actually, George. actually, there is. There's Boy, a city what? in Cal. I saw it pop up on one of these news feeds that mm -hmm. a uh, small town in Northern California has made itself a sanctuary city for the unvaccinated. Cool, uh, all right. They will not be compelled to be vaccinated or wear masks or do any of these things that you have to do in Los Angeles and other places. Uh, I'm gonna declare right now, the RV named Monstro, with which I live, is a sanctuary for the unvaccinated. And bring money to help pay for repairs, please. Okay, let's move on to some more stories. Um, we got some insider information uh, on GAFCON UK. And I thought we could talk about that without revealing sources. Um, but I think it's important because we've kind of watched this journey um, of good news, bad news coming out of uh, GAFCON UK. And I think now, I don't want to say we could put the nail in the coffin, but it they seem defunct. And l let's tell people what we know. Well, the various evangelical... Uh, Anglican groups that have broken away from the Church of England had a meeting recently. Mm -hmm. um, we've not had details because they wanted to keep it quiet amongst themselves, but we can sort of speak to what we already know about the lay of the land and what we've learned that has not contradicted what we already knew. As an aside, uh, our correspondents report that at the leadership level, the Anglo-Catholic movement in England has pretty much gone over to the gay side, and Gavin Ashton was the last Orthodox Anglo-Catholic leader. This does not mean that there are not Anglo-Catholic faithful clergy and people, right. but I'm talking about leaders and bishops and people uh, in the public eye. They've, you know, like the flying bishops, uh, the Bishop of Fulham or uh, so on, are just disappointments. Yes. Well, let's talk about the evangelical. They're really a bunch of players. There's GAFCON UK, Anglican Futures, Anglican Mission in England, Anglican Convocation of Europe. Uh, as far as we can tell, GAFCON UK is defunct. It's uh, earlier this year, we reported about our financial filings with the Charity Commission. They had like less than, for 2020, less than uh, 10,000 in income and expenses. I think that was, uh, that was actually GAFCON itself. No, yeah. GAFCON, no, no, GAFCON <laughs> UK, not GAFCON itself. <laughs> but GAFCON UK has essentially closed up shop. Yeah. Uh, it still may have the registration and the letterhead stationary, but it's not doing anything. Mm -hmm. 
Anglican convocation in Europe is egalitarian in its understanding of women clergy. What does that mean? They mean that they accept the orders and ministry of women priests. The Anglican mission in England is also evangelical, but it is complementarian. They believe that men and women have distinct roles in the ministry of the church, and one woman's role is not that of a priest. Now, the Anglican, the convocation and AMIE are alive, and they're moving forward. They're very small very small in terms of absolute number. Their clergy have taken a tremendous step in leaving the established Church of England and striking out on their own. And in this work, they've been helped by people from the ACNA, people whose names I've heard are like Foley Beach, Trevor Walters from ANIC, who just retired uh, this past weekend, uh, Phil Ashy, have been sources of encouragement and support because they've not had it from their English leadership. The establishment English leadership, the uh, flying evangelical bishop, leaders of the church society and renew and all that, they don't give them the time of day to these people because unless you're on side, you're a leper. And what these two groups, ACE, Anglican Convocation in Europe and Anglican Mission in England, as I understand it, they're both diocese, proto-diocese information There'll be non-geographic, one for those with women clergy, one with those without women clergy. And they seek to grow from that base. They seek to emulate one of the strengths of the ACNA, which is the ability to agree, to disagree on this issue. Well, well do, they, do, they, do they start with flying priests? I mean, or, or flying bishops? Well, they don't really have, well, they have a bishop in the form of Andy Lyons for AMIE. Mm -hmm. But Lyons will not uh, ordain a woman, and you know they have a different worldview. Now the ACNA will ordain women, mm -hmm. so maybe they'll have Charlie Masters or Trevor Walters or one of the Canadians fly over and ordain clergy for them. Okay, but it's see this new synod of the Church of England. It's the first new one, and sixty percent of new members, and so there's nothing really major happening. So we're in a period of stasis right now with the Church of England as they sort of legislatively get themselves up to gear. They will be getting into the gay business with living love, sounds like a Julia Roberts movie, living love and faith, uh, like that, yeah. eat, eat, live and be happy, whatever it is, whatever their reports name. <laughs> They're gonna get there, but they've got about a year or so while this percolates. And now it's the time administratively, functionally for the conservative evangelicals in England to really capitalize, but they're poor, they're scattered, and they don't have any leadership from the retired ranks of the Church of England, which is one of the reasons why Nazar Ali's uh, defection to Rome was so devastating, because he was somebody who could have done something, but well, he chose not to. I think other than Mecca, I can't think of any ground harder to plant seeds on right now than the UK. Um, you know, we've had so many. <laughs> Fairfield, <laughs> Fairfield County. <laughs> That's right. Milford. Um, but we had so many false starts there. You know, we're, you know, GAFCON 2, we're going we're gonna to retake uh, uh, England for Anglicanism. We're going to go in there, we're going to uh, uh, plant GAFCON in there, and in, in no time at all, people will see that, you know, we have a good leadership, we have a good course, and of course they'll come onto our side. Well, the middle management, the bureaucracy, um, the Church of England being what it was, uh, there was just no way to grow GAFCON. And we've had all these false starts. And I don't know what's going to happen now with the evangelicals. It, it's going to be interesting to watch. Are they just going to be slower to react now, watching what happened to GAFCON UK? Or are they going to be uh, fighting and squabbling over uh, women's orders again? I'm optimistic, which I'm always optimistic. I remain an Episcopalian, so I have to be optimistic. You really, that, yes. Uh, and I am optimistic because Christ is still Lord. The battle has been won. Satan's been defeated. Um, and I'm in Florida, all good things. The modern world with its communications and the changing nature of church 
from a traditional viewpoint, because the AMIE and ACE don't have magnificent buildings and a plot and a church around every block, they're considered a failure compared to the Church of England, which has beautiful architecture and is everywhere. Mm -hmm. But it's not the fabric, but the spirit that uh, really counts. And the spirit of the Lord is not confined or channeled by architecture and institutions. Um, and I think that if they are faithful to the spirit of the Lord, it will take its own course. Um, I'd sort of say that myself about my part of the world here in Florida. We're part of the Episcopal Church and we read everywhere about the devastation and all this and that and how many people are lost and such crazy things. Uh, one of the things that came across my desk this morning was the cathedral in South Dakota is doing a healing service for those transgendered people hurt by the world. Well, Kevin, I think my parish is going to hold a healing service for middle-aged white men who are annoyed with MSNBC. Yes. And we, we will have a service to weep and mourn together at the loss and the passing of uh, Walter Cronkite and Huntley and Brinkley. And not Dan rather, but no, no, my, no. the point that I'm trying to, the point that I'm trying to make is that uh, you know the spirit is alive and at work in places that you'd be most surprised in. Mm -hmm. uh, what good ever came out of Bethlehem? Uh, I remember reading that somewhere. I don't know. Where, I don't know. It's, it, it's what it's right. good ever came out of Hooterville, Florida, or or uh, Foey, uh Cornwall in England. <laughs> Yet God will use these places for the renewal of His kingdom. Yeah. Now, one of the cool things about RV life is every once in a while, a bug from outside gets in, and I see my wife. She she got the the, the Dyson vacuum, so she's she's out searching for that bug. It was in the bedroom, dear. No bugs allowed in the bedroom. <laughs> yeah, you hear it? <laughs> she got it. Um, well, uh, that, so that's this, that's why spiritually I'm encouraged mm -hmm. because I see the Lord at work. I see healings take place. I see his glory being made manifest in the most surprising places. Mm -hmm. I see it in the prison that I visit in Hernando County next door. Mm -hmm. God at work. Institutionally and technologically speaking, because you and I used to be separated by 1,500 miles. Now we're separated by about 100 miles. We're able to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation and have a degree of intimacy that the old Kevin and George, when I would film my video and you, we would both simultaneously press the play button, <laughs> then spend five hours uploading it, and then you would try to match it up. The, the, the leaps in technology and the ability to people to sort of communicate and live in this world that we're now facing gives opportunity for the proclamation of the gospel and the, and the fellowship of Jesus Christ. Yeah. But I don't know how it's going to work out, but I'm confident that it will. No, and, and we know that it will because uh, it's revealed in, in the promises in Scripture. Uh, we know how this ends, uh, but we have to keep up the good faith, the good race uh, while we're in it. And um, that that is kind of what I love about uh, my Christian walk is uh, the worst of the day is when I'm on my knees uh, before my Lord, uh, asking for forgiveness and, and having him lead me. The best of my days is when I'm on my knees uh, before the Lord, asking forgiveness and asking that he lead me. And that's that's Christianity. I'll give you a hard example, I think, of the, this changing nature thing. When the pandemic began, our friend Gavin started with a morning prayer that he would do in his shed, which yeah. was converted to a uh, chapel. Um, but way before the pandemic. Um, when the pandemic started, everybody went online, and one of the things I did was I started doing morning and evening prayer. Morning prayer at 7 a.m. and Compline at 10 p.m. And I'm now about, I've now done it every night, every morning for about almost two years. Mm -hmm. And I've seen the viewership as tallied by the number of views on YouTube and Facebook and this and that fluctuate from very high levels at the beginning to dropping to nothing and then coming back. But now I would say more than 75% of my viewers are regulars from England, from around the world. I mean, I've got a little congregation that, you know, maybe one in 10 people 
are members of my local congregation who watch me every day. But I have these other people who pray with me and follow the calendar of the church life from around the world. Is that worship, not that now there's no communion, it's morning prayer and Copland, but is that worship any less pleasing to God than being in a big, beautiful, magnificent building with the same number of people? <laughs> Well, I mean, that's that's the, kind of the, dis the discussion we're having now. Uh, my church is like, how soon can we stop with with the Facebook feed? Um, and that's that's a great question because there is a, a different intimacy uh, that humans have with their Lord when we're gathered together. We're told to gather together to encourage one another. We gather together to worship. We gather together for fellowship and to uh, to express this Christian uh, love so much better. We gather together much less post-COVID. When do we stop the Facebook feed? My, my uh, church is like, well, Advent 1, we're just going to post the sermons on that line, not the whole worship. I, no decisions have been made, but this is the thought process. Because we want to be sure that we provide every opportunity and encouragement for people actually to come back to church because the worship is different. and. Um, however, we want the whole body of Christ to be able to experience this, and some people can't. Like Kevin and Jill, they, they bought a camper and moved to Florida. How are they going to uh, come to Sunday service? So um, COVID changed everything. Uh, it made a new class of lepers, and it made a church reach into the Internet to express itself and to provide worship and to provide a way forward. Uh, more people have searched uh, for Jesus on the internet in the last two years than any time before. Um, because there's a hunger now and a loneliness provided by COVID, provided by the, uh, the uh, lunacy around our economy, provided by uh, the lack of jobs, that people are now in search of what we have. And we better start showing them the salt and showing them the light. Um, otherwise, this opportunity that God has given us COVID was an opportunity, uh, will be missed, George. Mm -hmm. So, mm. all right, a uh, quick news item before we go. Um, the Biden Can we administration. Do the story? Yeah, that's I'm going to get to that here. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's right. right, right. Well, we did the, the we did the Nigerian voter story. I want to do yes. the uh, uh, the all these foreign countries that are now non-prosecutorial towards Christians, uh, including Syria. Uh, the Biden administration says uh, Nigeria is safe, Syria is safe, all those places that used to persecute Christians under the Trump administration no longer persecute Christians, and we can uh, declare them safe zones and not send them money so that they can protect their Christians. I'm like, Ooh, I don't know, George. We should probably talk about this because the reports we're getting from Nigeria, Syria, Pakistan, and all these places, it's very dangerous to express your Christian faith. The Biden administration, you know, when I was in high school, we had the model UN, we had the geeks who would play Dungeons and Dragons instead of going to the uh, pep rally or to the college or to the high school basketball game. You know, we had those people. Where did they wind up in life? Well, they became Episcopal priests or they worked for the Biden administration because there are some real loosey-goosey-eyed, <laughs> clueless people. Well, the I have... U.S. State Department is required every year to list countries where religious persecution takes place. And this year, they re this is the first year they've released their own list. In the past, it was always, you know, this is the first pure Biden list. And the Biden administration is playing politics once again. They've removed Nigeria, India, Syria, and another nation, uh, Iraq, from places where Christians are persecuted. And then they've added in all these Rus Russia and all these Russian satellite countries. Well, I don't doubt that there is Christian persecution in these Russian satellite places, Azerbaijan, uh, all the stands mm -hmm. in the Middle East. But... Under, under Obama, the U.S. State Department said there is no religious persecution in Nigeria. Boko Haram is not motivated by Islam. It's all climate change. The climate change, it's the desert moving south. It's forcing the Fulani Muslim tribesmen to migrate south. It's all climate change. It has nothing to do with religion. Trump called BS on that. And when he was president, he met with Muhammadu Buhari, mm -hmm. president of Nigeria, and said, 
stop persecuting your Christians or there will be consequences from the US government. The Biden administration comes in and in the places where Trump basically said stop persecuting, Biden said there is no persecution in India, in Nigeria, in Syria, in Iraq, and took those countries off lists of, cons of places. It's pure politics. It's pure idiocy. Whatever the Trump administration did, these, these dweebs have come in and undone it. Uh, f uh, and this is in an area of Christian persecution. No, I've not seen. There's a genocide this. going on in the uh, Kaduna state yeah. of Fulani tribesmen murdering Christian farmers. Syria and is still in a, yeah. Syria is still in a civil war. Uh, Christians are being persecuted left and right. Pakistan, Afghan, uh, it, it's ridiculous. But this is this is John Kerry isk State Department. You know that the, he was a fool as a as a leader of the State Department. I hate to use that word. I don't use it lightly, but um, they just don't know. You know, it, it's better to get along and, and go along than it is to to cause change in the world except climate change yeah i remember we once had a debate was justin will be a fool or just a knave and i think we're coming into that same series of questions about obama and his relationship with the world about biden you meet with china biden. for six hours a uh, biden and you yeah. meet with china sorry <laughs> uh, you meet with well, biden met with uh premier xi of china for six hours and what did he not mention COVID. I mean, COVID. Let's not mention that. Let's not mention that. Uh, mentioning the militarization of the South China Sea and mm. you know threatening the, the Googlogs for the Muslims. Yeah. You know, and the the, the Uyghurs and yeah. fishing to extinction the world's oceans and basically dragnetting all the reefs of the Philippines. Mm. You know, not only are the Chinese poisoning us with COVID, they're going to be starving us by emptying the seas. What does Biden say? Back better. <sighs> I don't know. I don't know. It, it, it's crazy. I don't like. I don't like to get political, friends. I'm sorry. No, but it, uh, it, but that's part of what's you know. Uh, you can't not say Christianity is not political um, because th there is a political realm to Christianity. However, I believe every time Jesus was asked a political question, he answered it in a very non-political way, and we are to be politically non-political uh, you mean jesus was an episcopalian and a republican no, sorry that's what you just described <laughs> <laughs> our, our definitions may differ um so it, you know and we don't want unscripted to be about politics we want it to be about uh, the church but sometimes things come across our news feed that we just need to talk about this so oh, it's friday let's let's have a free for all george i think that's all the stories i'm looking here at the uh uh got the the well, voter we, we want to we, we want to thank we, we want to uh, congratulate uh, uh dan clifford the new coadjutor bishop yep. of anic yeah anglican network in canada yep. elected someone very un-canadian he has personality, pizzazz, charm, uh, <laughs> just like Charlie Masters. So yeah, he, he did uh, too. I mean, they they find uh, Canadians that have great personalities, and they, they make them bishops, and we appreciate that. Um, also, I did an interview with a uh, Dean Pon, Dean Pon, Dean Paul uh, Donison uh, about the new Pro Cathedral for the ACNA. You can find that on Anglican uh, TV if you go to the uh, the YouTube channel. And it, it was a good a good news story. So those are fun to do, those, those interviews. I think that's it, George. Tuesday, you're not doing anything. Or, 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 do you want to take Thanksgiving week off? We could do that. No, I'm sure there will be plenty of there'll things be. to talk about. <laughs> there will. In fact, you and I are having Thanksgiving dinner together, but we'll talk about that later. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 702 of Anglican Unscripted.